Cheers, and welcome to Bitter Reality Brewing. Yes, this is the fermentation series, and this is preventing a stuck fermentation. Yes, this one has got about 16 different items. I limited it to, I think I said 12, but one's broke down in like four sections. So yeah, technically it's about 16, and it's probably the most in-depth of the series so far, and probably going to be the most in-depth video on the fermentation series. We've covered how to fix a stuck fermentation, um, what causes a stuck fermentation, and this is preventing a stuck fermentation. Some of the items will overlap. I made these videos separate because I know sometimes people are searching for something very specific and that's what they're gonna go look for and that's the information they need. So hopefully this helps. If it helps, don't forget like, subscribe, keep sharing. If you just like it, if you wanna make a comment, if you got a suggestion on something I missed or maybe a little bit more detail, you wanna go in and, you know, down that rabbit hole, Go for it. Definitely appreciate any kind of feedback. Always appreciate it. So yeah, having another Harvest Autumn IPA from Southern Tier. Freaking good IPA. Just really, really good. It's nice and it's different compared to most of the IPAs. That's why I like it. It's different and it's good. So we're going to jump right into this. Like I said, there's about 16. I'm only going to go 12 and then one's going to break out into four. So it is what it is. But number one, preventing a stuck fermentation. Fresh, healthy, yeast and yes i keep a yeast bank going but i smell it i make sure it looks like it's repopulating i want to make sure it's healthy and i'm even learning and going to school soon in Asheville to learn more from white labs so i can understand how to do a better job but like this i mean doesn't expire till i think that was yesterday okay Bad example, but hey, you get what I'm saying. So <laughs> it's just something to bear, be aware of. Fresh, healthy yeast. Try to check those dates. I'll be fine. I just need to do a yeast starter and get it going. Number two, what did I just say? I need to do a yeast starter. Yes, yeast starters help massively. When I was buying to do the loggers, my first ones, I did a yeast starter and they just did not do as well. The third logger I did, I did a yeast starter and did a yeast starter and then find the third yeast starter on that same yeast. I pitched that bad boy and I didn't even pitch at all. And it just rock and rolled. I mean, that yeast was like, yeah, let's keep going. Let's keep going. So yeast starters help massively. And I know I get people out there, I've never had to do that. And honestly, with a lot of the dry yeasts, they do great without them. But if you're doing liquid, do a yeast starter. Just trust me on that one. Pitching the right, yep, number three, pitching the right amount of yeast or slightly over pitching. Over pitching is always better than under pitching, always. There was an item I didn't put on this list, which was massively over pitching, where it went shooting out and you lost most of your yeast out of the top. I think there will be a very slim amount of people that have that issue. If not, go ahead and go, hey, I had that problem. But yeah, so under pitching is not good. So pitching the right amount of yeast, or like I said, a little bit more. Number four, pitching yeast at the recommended temperatures. Those temperatures, if you're not sure, you can look them up on the manufacturer's site. Uh, dry yeast sometimes will actually recommend pitching it at a slightly warmer temperature, just to kind of get things going, you know, but not a, not a huge difference. So pitching the yeast at the recommended temperatures, that's number four. Number five, and this is the one that's gonna break out into a bunch of little things, is using the right yeast for the wort and environment. What do I mean by that? Yeah, I know, gotta break it down. Is use A, out of five, five A, use yeast that works for the temperature you can maintain. Okay, I know there's gonna be a little fluctuation, but let's, let's <clears throat> dial it in, you know, dial it in. What is the temperature you maintain? So if you know you can keep it around 45, 50 degrees, you might wanna be looking at lager yeast. If you know you can keep it around 68, 70 degrees, ale yeast. If you can't keep it under 85 degrees Fahrenheit, like, you know, there are yeasts for every grade of temperature. The key is, is maintaining that temperature, keeping it as constant as possible. B, of, and I get comments on this, but that's okay. I'd rather discuss it than leave it out. Avoid high flocculating yeast if you know your temperatures are going to swing greatly. They are more likely to fall out of suspension early. Yes, I love high attenuation, high flocculating yeast because I want my beer clear and I want it dry, but it can also bite you in the butt. 
if you know your temperatures are going to be swaying a little bit more than they should, you know, rocking that boat, yes, there is a higher probability it's going to flocculate earlier and fall out of suspension. Low, no, C, 5C, low attenuating yeast might just be done early. So it's not that the yeast is bad, it's that you didn't, may not have used the right yeast. So if you're using a low attenuating yeast, not all, but a lot of them, will leave some residual sweetness. So if you're going for something like a dry beer, like a brewed IPA, you may want to go to a high attenuating or at least a medium, but a high attenuating yeast. Pick the yeast, like I said in the beginning on five, and that's why five is kind of comprised of all these items. Pick the right yeast. So <laughs> D, and D is something that I watch very closely. D is expected ABV. If you chose a yeast that is rated as high as 8%, but you're shooting for 12%, you're gonna have a sweet beer. Yeah, you're gonna have a problem. There is always a chance it can go a little higher, but people will tell you, yeast converts wort to beer and alcohol, and alcohol is toxic to yeast over time and in greater quantities. So as that yeast is cooking away and that alcohol starts going up, it just starts dying off to the point that you killed your yeast. Yeah, and you're gonna end up with maybe an 8% beer that you wanted to be at 12%, which means it's gonna be sweet. So expected ABV, pick the yeast that is rated for what you're going to be doing. Number six, fermentation temperatures must, and giant words, must be maintained for most yeasts. Yes, I'm not saying, you know, this farmhouse isn't gonna tolerate a little swing a little bit more than maybe a West Coast or this Hefeweizen yeast, but what I'm saying is, Fermentation temperatures must be maintained for most yeasts. Not too hot, not too cold, not too much of a temperature swing. And like I said, high flocculating yeasts are more prone to falling out of suspension earlier if the temperatures are going like you're out in the middle of a storm in the ocean. So keep that aware. Number seven, keep your fermenter sealed. Sealed. Don't open ferment. I know some people are doing that and I know you can get away with it sometimes, but you're asking for a problem. So unless you're doing an experiment where you're willing to sacrifice that entire batch, keep things sealed, get your bubbler, get your blow off, whatever you need to do, but keep things sealed. And that's number seven. Number eight, nutrients in the wort. Yes. Oh my gosh, it's like vitamins, but for the yeast, yes you need to have the nutrients. So if you're using spring water, cause you're a beginner, you're fine. If you're, you know, a pro, you've been out, you could be using RO, distilled, add your brewing salts. There are certain nutrients that you may also wanna add some, just so you give it a little bit buffer. You know, I'd rather give it a little bit extra than not enough. So, number nine, aerating your wart. Yes. <laughs> you're hoping that there's enough oxygen in the air that when you shake that wort, you get it in some of that into suspension into the wort so that the yeast eats it. Yeast needs a fair amount of oxygen when it's first getting started and thriving and repopulating and you know just building its massive army to go in and eat all those sugars. So keep that in mind. If you're doing, and like I said, this is relevant for more for a five gallon batch, if I do something that's a measurement, when I did some high ABV beers, yeah, anything up there, say 10, 12%, I'm juicing them with 15 seconds of pure O2. Yeah, I mean, aerating's nice, but if you're doing a high ABV beer, even if you're up around a seven or eight, you may wanna consider it, but if you're going up over 10, definitely, definitely consider it. Get yourself a little O2 bottle, you know, online or at your local homebrew shop, get your little stone and everything, keep it clean and pump in a good 15 seconds of O2 Yeast will love you, trust me. You should love the O2, but hey, you know, you can take the credit. Number 10, use clean water. Clean water. I think we've mentioned this before in one of the home brewing tips, quality water. So no chlorine, um, either by removing it or not using anything that has chlorine or chloramine. And I keep seeing people thinking that if you put water in here and you let it air out for a couple of days, chloramine will go away too. No, you, you get your Campton tablets, you can do that. I just avoid it, I buy distilled. Um, hopefully in the new place I'll have RO. But yeah, clean water and avoid anything that has chemicals in it. Number 11, and, and kind of goes back to the whole 
you know, number eight on nutrients, but 11. If you're a beginner, just go ahead and use spring water. That way you know you're getting your minerals. You'll be fine. You'll figure it out. Don't worry about that initially. There's enough to worry about when you're home brewing. But I would highly recommend anytime you use distilled or RO, make sure you add the brewing salts. Don't just say, I'm going to use distilled because I heard it's better. Yeah, that's if you know what you're doing and you can add the brewing salts. That's a different video and brewing salts aren't that hard unless you really want to get super scientific and down to like the microgram. Yeah, just brewing salts, you need to add them. Magnesium in very tiny amounts is huge for yeast. No magnesium, no production. So yeah, just basically, yeah, use quality water. We'll just go back to the quality water thing again. And number 12, if you are doing something like a cider or anything that has a juice or something like that, that you're adding some flavoring, even to the beer, make sure it does not have certain chemicals in it that can destroy the yeast or kill the yeast. Potassium sorbate, um, I know there's another one. Sodium benzate, yeah, benzate, I just know it's bad. But <laughs> sodium benzate, potassium, sorbate. There's probably others out there, but yeah, anytime you're going to go buy something, you know, you got your little smartphone, look it up and say, okay, those are all safe. I'm good. You know, or hopefully I'm safe. If you can get fresh, great. If you can get something that's designed for beer brewing or ciders or things like that, you know, you're going to be safe because they're not going to have those chemicals already in there. Yes, that is preventing what to do and how to prevent a stuck fermentation. Basically, it's how to get the best possible fermentation out of your brew as far as everything with the exception of, of course, your fermenter itself or your fermentation temperature controls will go down that rabbit hole a little later. So don't forget, cheers, like, subscribe, keep sharing. Definitely appreciate it. I'm going to go enjoy this because it's really freaking good.